Thank you for logging in to view this lesson on living things and their habitats. This is the first of five lessons that you are going to be set online and you will then have a follow up quiz in class. So these are all topics that you ought to have done during year six, but obviously because of lockdown, you may have missed one or more of them. So if you've done them before, just think of these lessons as revision lessons. And if it's all new to you, don't worry, I'm going to go through everything that you need to know. So what we're looking at today then are living things and their habitats. We're going to first think about what classification is and some examples. We're going to look at the Linnaean system of classification. We're going to identify the characteristics of different animals and we are going to sort those animals into different classes. So first things first, I've got two questions for you. The first is what is classification? And the second, why do we classify animals and plants into particular groups? Classification is very simply the arrangement of animals and plants into different groups according to their similarities. So for example, you might group two animals together because they both grow feathers. You might group two plants together because they both grow on riverbanks. And these are their similarities in their characteristics. So why do we bother to actually classify these plants and animals into the different groups? That's because there might be as many as 10 million different species of animals and plants in the world. And it's really important to sort them into classes so that we can then study the appropriate groups. For example, if you were studying a new species of bird, you might look at the other birds that are very similar and in the same class to see if they're going to have similar habitats if they eat similar things. Now, a simple way to class animals might be to ask simple questions that separate them into different groups. So what I've got here is a panda, a lion, a penguin and a squid. And we can have a go at asking questions that will split them up into classes. So the first question then, is it a mammal? And remember, a mammal is a warm blooded animal that gives birth to live young and it produces milk for those young. So looking at our four animals here, pandas, lions, penguins and squid. Hopefully we know that the mammals are the pandas and the lion and on animals that are not mammals will be the penguin and the squid. OK, so so far we've split those four animals into two groups, but we can try and split them further by asking more questions. So on the left hand side, then we've got are they a carnivore? And remember, a carnivore means that they are a meat eater. So out of our panda and lion, the lion is the carnivore and the panda is a herbivore. OK, so herbivore means that they only eat plants and an omnivore is an animal that will eat both meat and plants. Great. So we've now split down our panda and our lion, but we've still got the penguin and the squid. So we could ask another question. Are they a bird? So we can say that our penguin is a bird and our squid is not. So we've now split those animals into four different groups using a system of classification. We can test our system by having a look at a few other animals and seeing if it works for them as well. So we've now got a swordfish on the left, then a gazelle, then we've got a common sparrow and a wolf. So if I were going to sort the swordfish, I would first ask, is it a mammal? And because it lives in the sea, I know it's got cold blood, so no, it's not a mammal. I can then ask, is our swordfish a bird? No, it's not. So our swordfish is going to end up in the same class as the squid. And that might tell me that the squid and the swordfish will have some similar characteristics. So what I'd like you to do is quickly pause the video and see if you can work out where the gazelle, the sparrow and the wolf will end up. OK, so hopefully you have got the following answers. So the wolf will end up with the lion over here. They're both carnivores. The gazelle will end up with our panda. They are both herbivores. And the sparrow will end up with the penguin. So this is quite a simple system of classification. And actually, scientists will tend to need to use a much more complicated one simply because there are so many animals and plants as well that need to be sorted. So that's where we come to this guy. This is Carl Linnaeus. He is a Swedish scientist 
He was born in 1707 and he died in 1778. And he was actually a botanist and a zoologist. So a botanist is someone who studies plants and a zoologist is someone who studies animals. And over his lifetime, he actually collected more than 40,000 samples of plants and animals that he then tried to sort into a system. So in the 1700s, there was no kind of classification system around. But Carl Linnaeus decided that it would be good if there was so that when you were studying them, you could look at all the animals or all the plants that had similar characteristics. You could actually make predictions about other animals and plants based on those groups. So he came up with what we now call the Linnaean system of classification. So Carl Linnaeus first published this book here, Systema Naturae, in 1735. And by 1758, he'd already written 10 more editions of this book, each one updating the information that was in there. And in his 10th edition, which was released in 1758, that's the one that we scientists tend to focus on most nowadays. And that said that there are three kingdoms, basically the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom and the mineral kingdom. And each of those was then divided up into lots more different sections to sort of narrow down the groups that everything was in. Now, since the, this was published in 1758, we have updated it a little bit. So the first thing that scientists have done is they got rid of minerals because minerals aren't alive. That means things like calcium or different metals. So they're in a different system. Instead, we're just looking at plants and animals, the two things that are alive. They also added something above a kingdom, and that's a domain. So if we have a look at the current system, which is based on the Linnaean system, we can see that at the top we've got all living things, and that is the domain. Under that we've got the kingdom, so that is divided into plants, animals, but also bacteria and other things. Underneath that we've got the phylum, and then class, then order, then family, genus and finally species. Now a domain is really general, it basically includes all the living things. So saying something's part of a specific domain doesn't really help you out. But when you get down to species, it's really specific. Imagine each step you go down this classification system, you are getting more and more specific every time. So we can look at that in a bit more detail. So there are three domains, that is archaea, bacteria and eukarya. Now all plants and animals are eukaryotes, so you are all eukaryotes. We then divide those down into kingdoms and there are six kingdoms which include animals, plants, fungi and bacteria. They then get divided down even further into the phyla so there are more than 30 phyla in the animal kingdom alone, okay? And an example would be phylum chordata, which includes all vertebrates. That's anything that's got a backbone. So each phyla is then divided into classes. So the chordata phylum includes amphibians, birds, mammals, reptiles, and fish. Then we've got order and family, which divide down into even smaller groups. Then we have a genus, so a genus includes the species that are very closely related and share unique body structures. And finally, we've got the very specific species. So this is a group of animals that can reproduce to produce fertile offspring. So you can imagine a species might be humans. Humans can obviously reproduce to make more humans who can then reproduce again. So if we have a look at a specific example here, an example I've chosen is this leopard here. His kingdom is the Animalia kingdom, so that means animals. His phylum is Chordata, which means he's got a backbone. The class is Mammalia, means he's a mammal. Order, Carnivora, so he's a carnivore, he eats meat. His family is Philidae, genus Panthera, and finally his species is Panthera pardus, okay? And there are different species of panthers. So it's really important that we've got the specific name there. He's a Panthera pardus. 
Now, a key note here is to remember that the genus and the species names are always written in italics. For example, the genus might be Canis and the species Lupus. So the names of the genus and species are used to give the specific name of an animal. So a dog would be known as Canis Lupus. And note that that is written in italics. Now we're going to have a look at these different classes in a bit more detail. So we already mentioned that mammals was a class when we looked at our snow leopard example. Other classes are fish, birds, reptiles and amphibians. And then we've got insects, arachnids, annelids, mollusks, crustaceans and echinoderms. So I've put those in two separate lists and there's actually a specific reason for that. So see if you can think why I might have put things like mammals, fish and birds on one side and insects, mollusks and crustaceans on the other. So the ones on the left hand side are all vertebrates and the ones on the right hand side are all invertebrates. Now a vertebrate is something that has a backbone, so humans are vertebrates and invertebrates don't, so insects and crustaceans do not have a backbone. So well done if you got that right. And this is just one of the other ways that we can narrow down the different classes and the different species that animals and plants are in. So I think we know lots of examples of mammals. These include things like humans, lions, dogs, and we all know fish as well. Things like tuna, swordfish, birds. We know lots of examples as well. It might be pigeons, sparrows, penguins even and reptiles as well. So a reptile is something that is cold blooded and has eggs instead of live young. So an example of a reptile would be like a snake or a bearded dragon, something like that. An amphibian is a bit harder. So that is a vertebrate that needs either water or a moist environment. And that might be things like frogs, toads or newts. So we're going to focus more on the invertebrates now because I think they are the lesser known classes. So first off, we're going to have a look at insects and arachnids. Now an insect is a creature with their bodies in three segments and they're protected by a hard shell. So they've got three pairs of legs. Most of them have antennae and some of them have wings. So examples of insects might be beetles or common house flies. Then we've got arachnids. So the most common arachnid is a spider. All arachnids have eight legs and they don't have antennae, unlike insects. Now their bodies are divided into only two sections as well, whereas insects had three. Then we've got the annelids and the mollusks. Now an annelid doesn't have any limbs. Their bodies are divided into segments instead and they're cold blooded. So an annelid might be a worm is the classic example. Then we've got our mollusks. So most mollusks have a soft body which is covered in a hard shell as you can see on our snail over here. Some of them live on land and move along this flat sole which is what we call sort of the bottom of their body there. And others live in the water and they will attach themselves to hard surfaces like rocks and that might be a limpet as an example. Then we've got the crustaceans and the echinoderms. So a crustacean has a hard shell to protect its body. They have a head and an abdomen and lots of them have claws that help them to crawl and eat. And examples might be lobsters or prawns or crabs. And then lastly, we've got these echinoderms. So these creatures live in the ocean and they have arms and legs that radiate from the center of their body. Now that central bit contains their organs and their mouths. And a key example here are starfish. So here we've got pictures of 11 different animals and each of them relate to one of the 11 classes that are written above. So what I'd like you to do is pause the video now and see if you can work out which class each of these animals belong to. So hopefully we all know that this guy over here is our bird. Next we've got our mollusk. This frog here, he's an amphibian. This starfish is an echinoderm. Our worm is an annelid. This guy's a fish. 
We've got our arachnid here. This is a reptile, it's actually a Komodo dragon. This guy here is a crustacean. We've got our mammal here, and finally our beetle, who is an insect. So that is the end of the lesson today. So just to summarize, we have looked at different living things and their habitats. We've looked at classification. We've looked at the Linnaean system of classification. We had a look at identifying characteristics and sorting animals into different classes. Now your quiz in your lesson next week will be a 20 question quiz. It'll be a mix of some easy multiple choice questions. There might be some matching up to do. There might be a few longer questions where you'll have to write maybe a sentence or two in your answer. But all of the answers you need are in this video here. So thank you for watching.